start again. <laughs> you'll, if you attend all these sessions, you'll have more knowledge about Calvinism than uh, probably 99.5% of the whole entire population of the United States. So uh, uh, it's, uh, I think you'll be well versed and be able to uh, both uh, see the problems with Calvinism and also uh, the true gospel message and the gospel offer, which I distinguish uh, in uh, evangelism and speaking and things like that. So uh, let's see if this uh, works. Let's see if it works. It should advance. Try it again. There we go. That is the second slide. All right. Uh, I've called this this uh, evening the the uh, Calvinism the theological house of dominoes, and when we think of a domino and you know you line them all up and if you tip one over, the whole line falls over. And my suggestion is that the house of dominoes will fall. The theological house of dominoes will fall uh, when election unto salvation is shown to be incorrect. And that's, uh, that's essentially my point. Now, Calvinism, as you know, uh, goes by an acrostic uh, entitled TULIP. And just by way of introduction, it stands for total depravity, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And each one of those is identified by T-U-L-I-P in the beginning. So. Uh, you will have these batted back and forth probably constantly during this, this uh, seminar. And I think you, if you have questions uh, now, you won't have them at the end because it will be explained probably several times as we go through. But that's good because repetition helps us to remember things. Uh, I put Calvinism hinges on the doctrine of unconditional election unto eternal life. Now. There is a biblical doctrine of election, but my problem with the Calvinist view of election is that they have defined election in an incorrect way, and that is that it is unto eternal life or unto salvation, to use a broader term. Uh, the Calvinist, ar Calvinist argument is that the doctrine of unconditional election is fundamental, and we will keep trying here. Before the creation, they would say, God sovereignly and unconditionally chose only specific people to be eternally saved and either passively relegated the rest to eternal hell by failing to choose them, just letting them go unsaved, or specifically choosing them for that fiery destination. And so, that, that's a, one of the things that election has to say. Now, you, that's logical because if uh, some are chosen and some aren't, then those who aren't don't get chosen. And therefore, they will never receive eternal life because only those who are chosen, according to the Calvinist view, will receive eternal life. Uh, secondly, then, those whom he unconditionally elected for eternal salvation are then later in time sovereignly regenerated by the Holy Spirit so that they can believe by the imposition of irresistible sovereign grace and are thus eternally saved. But the rest, not so selected, will never receive this efficacious grace or effectual grace or that grace which causes or brings about the possibility of believing so as that they might obtain eternal life. So what I'm doing is just explaining to you the argument uh, and the view of the Calvinist regarding election. Therefore, the presence of regenerate believers, that is, Christians in this age, is proof that some have been elected and that some have not. If you line ten people up and you give them the gospel uh, and only two of them believe out of the ten, I used to believe, and this was my perspective of things, only those two had been elected from eternity past. And then I came to realize that that's not biblical. It's a cool little illustration, and it 
kind of fits together, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think I pushed the button twice. Total depravity. Here, here are some, uh, let's see. Yeah. The argument uh, that the, the dominoes that are behind election, if it falls, are the whole rest of the, the acrostic. Total depravity is the first one. It is the teaching that no person is able to believe for eternal life apart from the application of irresistible sovereign grace. Now, a key word or a buzzword, an identifying word of Reformed theology in regard to the Calvinistic uh, plan or system of salvation in their view is the words sovereign grace. Uh, we were coming up through Casper, and I like to look at the phone book yellow pages to see what kind of churches are in town. And there's a church, it's a, only a single category, it's called Sovereign Grace, all right? So you know good and well that that church is a Reformed uh, uh, thinking church or in regard to Reformed theology. So total depravity isn't, and they will say this initially, total depravity is not uh, mankind being as bad as he could be. Not everybody has the evil built within him as did Hitler or Saddam Hussein or any other tyrannical dictator that you might come to think of. Uh, they will say that initially, but then they go ahead and act as though uh, that's the case. And I've seen this kind of, it's sort of a contradiction. They say man is so bad that he is so bent against God that he doesn't search for God and uh, that uh, <clears throat> there's no way that he can be saved. So they turn total depravity, and that is what I would define total depravity as, as a complete and total lostness, if you can use that term, uh, an unsaved condition a state of being in sin in which you cannot do anything to work yourself out of. And so there is nothing that we can do. We are totally unable to do anything in order to uh, be saved. But they define the total depravity somewhat differently. Calvinists will say that man is not able to believe and really what they mean by total depravity, if you ask them, is that mankind, that is any individual particular person, is uh, unable to, having heard a gospel message, unable to put his trust in Jesus for eternal life. And uh, it's a question of ability. They define faith, of course, and I'm a little bit off subject here, but they def the reason is they define faith as something that you do. Whenever you have anything where you do, do, you cannot do it. So if you cannot do something, you can't be saved. And they say you cannot have faith or believe because believing is doing something. And we would object to that totally. Faith is not doing something. Faith is what happens to us uh, when we hear the gospel message and are convinced of its truth and accept its message, and of course the person with it. We believe in the person of Jesus as the Savior, and that's the difference. I hope that's clear. The second thing is limited atonement. The teaching that Christ died only for or in place of the elect, leaving the non-elect without remedy. Well, if election falls, then you don't have that problem. If Jesus died for everyone, as the Scriptures seem to say, in several places, that conflicts with the doctrine of election that God only selected some. So why would Jesus waste his good blood on those people who aren't going to be elected or ever see heaven? They teach total depravity. There's no need for total depravity if election falls. There's no need for limited atonement. And the third aspect is irresistible grace. Maybe I'm not pointing this right. There we go. I think I'll point it down. 
Irresistible grace is the teaching that uh, since no person is able to believe of himself or on his own, the Holy Spirit must regenerate a person to, uh, so that he can believe because dead men can't do anything. And remember, believing in Jesus is doing something in, in the Calvinist perspective. So they say dead men can't do anything. Well, that's cool. That's a neat little illustration. Do you ever go to a funeral? The person in the casket isn't doing anything. He's not even, he can't believe. It's too late. They say you're dead in your sins, and therefore you can't believe. You're not able to believe. Therefore, you need to be regenerated in order that you may believe. So you have life before you have faith in their view. Now, I've heard Calvinists deny this, but I can show them many places in their writings where they will, uh, they will be uh, contradicted in the Calvinist writing. The fourth one is perseverance of the saints. And this is just a very early review on the subject of Calvinism. And it may be just review to most, most of you. Uh, the perseverance of the saints, the teaching that those unconditionally elected <coughs> specifically died for by Christ and regenerated by the Holy Spirit so that they can have faith, will without fail persevere to the end of their lives in faith and holiness. Those who fall away or fail are considered unregenerate, false believers, uh, and were never chosen for eternal life in the first place. So they would say that you're a pseudo-believer if you should happen to go astray, either doctrinally or uh, uh, morally. And so if you, as a believer in Jesus, let's suppose you trusted Jesus when you were 10 or 12 years old, uh, as trusted in Him alone for eternal life, based on the promise that God, whoever, God says whoever does so will have eternal life. And then you grow up and you go morally astray in your teenage years and you die in a car accident at 18, then you weren't really saved probably because you didn't persevere in faith and holiness to the end. Or, and I heard a statistic and I'm not sure how true it is, and Don and I, we come from a Southern Baptist background as well, so I'm not criticizing anybody, <clears throat> but they say that most the biggest convert into Mormonism are Southern Baptists, the largest number of converts into Mormonism. Now, what do you do with a Southern Baptist who has believed in Jesus alone and is convinced by Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons uh, or goes into some other religion thinking that they can do better or this is the true way now? Uh, does God's promise become void of their eternal life? Do they not have it? Did they either lose it or really fail to trust Christ alone in the beginning? Uh, they would say that if a person uh, apostatizes morally or uh, doctrinally, that that person also cannot <clears throat> be considered as a saved individual or a saint. <clears throat> There we go. Another doctrine that falls without election, I've put the glory of God as demonstrated through His sovereignty in unconditional election and the ultimate salvation of the elect, of the elect is seen as the overriding impetus for God's soteriological plan. Their idea of the glory of God is different than my idea of the glory of God. When we think of the glory of God, we, we would say what uh, magnifies Him in the eyes of the people, what points to Him. We say that the heavens declare the glory of God, and by that we understand that the fact that we can look up into the night sky and see the constellations and the great creation that He has made. Uh, we understand that that points to the magnanimous person of God, that so big that in our little finite minds we cannot even fathom what God must be like. We only have a small idea, just, just enough to kind of consume our minds and 
make us realize how finite our understanding really is. To be in God's presence would be like if we were in sin, in a state of sin, it would be like an atom bomb blowing up in our face. We would be wiped out because of His tremendous power and magnitude. The glory of God to the Calvinist is, it depends upon whether or not He selects us because that's the only way He's going to get anybody to glorify Him. And we see from the Calvinist perspective, and this is where I think the problem lies, we see from the, the Calvinist perspective the, uh, the glory of God depending upon that, like God is a big guy in heaven who just really, really needs our worship and our praise. If he doesn't get it, oh, he's going to be so disappointed. Therefore, he has to elect a bunch of people that will guarantee that they will give him his praises that he deserves forever. Forever, They, they picture him, I think, and this is the way I see them picturing them, him anyway, as somebody who is really insecure, and he better make sure by electing certain ones that, or else maybe nobody would believe, and there he would be all alone again. But the glory of God is bigger than that. Uh, The glory of God has to do with uh, love that comes back because He loved us. We have the Scriptures in 1 John and other places that indicate that God first loved us and therefore we love Him. We respond to the love of God and nowhere does it say in the Scriptures that God ever elected anybody to salvation in the sense of eternal life. Well, that's, that's a kind of a very brief view of, of Calvinism. The problem with the system, as I've put, is that uh, I've put problems arise in the, in the uh, resulting dependence on the doctrine of election unto salvation. Here they are. Man seems to be unable to believe to, uh, uh, it's not quite spelled right, is it? Unable to believe most anything. Uh, he's, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Man seems to be able to believe most anything. We can believe that the lights are on. We can believe that it's a nice day. We can believe that it's Sunday evening at this location. Uh, we believe everything. If I said that I had a black pickup truck in the, in the, in the parking lot, you'd have no reason to disbelieve me, and I'm sort of a reputable guy, so I wouldn't tell you a lie. And you'd say, okay, he's got a black pickup truck in the parking lot. You're able to believe that. See, there's no problem with your ability to believe something. Uh, Calvinist says you can't believe the gospel. You can hear it, and you can understand the concepts, but you can't believe it because you're not elect. Well, election makes that problematic. Election unto salvation seems unfair and arbitrary. This is true. Uh, Where I had one girl in one class... She said to me, and I was explaining something about God's love and things, and she said, but God isn't fair. That comes directly from Calvinist teaching because they feel that God selects according to His secret knowledge and His secret will those people who will be His forever. And so to her, that's, uh, that's she could not say that's fair. Can you? You have, a, you have three children and God selects one of them for eternal life. Aren't you concerned about the other two? Well, you're, it's just tough because you can't do anything about it. They weren't elect, see. And you say, that's not fair. And you'd be right because God is fair. That's, that's the essence of things. And He's not arbitrary. The problem, the Bible does indicate that Jesus died for everyone. They deny this. Uh, They redefine the word word world. Uh, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever in that world believes in Him would have everlasting life. But they have to do something with the word world. They have to do something with the word all. Well, Those are specifics. Uh, 
Some believers do fall away. Oh, number four, man seems to be able to refuse to trust God for salvation. Gee, when you tell the gospel to somebody and give them the offer and they say we're not interested, what, uh, what's going on there? It seems to me that they are able to either believe or to refuse to consider the, the offer or the evidence. Uh, fifthly, some believers do fall away, either morally or doctrinally or both sometimes both, and when they do so, of course, that destroys the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints because they didn't persevere. And an illustration we were talking about last night among us was uh, the, uh, the act of suicide. If you have a believer or a member of your church who has believed in Jesus and becomes depressed or gets involved with drugs or has a family dispute and their spouse has left them, and I've seen all of those things, and you probably have too, and they, as a result, become so depressed and despondent that they kill themselves because they can't take the pressure and the hurt anymore, and because they, seem, they think that that seems to be the easiest way out because all the other options are gone, do they go to hell? They can't repent. They can't even say, I'm sorry, God, after they do it. Well, believers fall away, and the Calvinists won't allow that. They won't allow for failure or weakness in humanity. So when I go over this, and, and uh, I think I've probably got more to, to say than I'm going to have time to, to do. I'll try to just do this fast and perhaps just read it and comment shortly on it. Recognizing man's capability to believe restores the biblical understanding of the nature, and by nature I mean the internal character or essence of what it is to be man or human. Man, having retained the image of God, is free and therefore responsible and accountable. This realization clarifies the nature of man as God has revealed a responsible agent, not a robot. In other words, we don't seem to be too unable to believe because we're made in the image of God, and God is able to do things intellectually like believe or do anything else. Uh, Recognizing God's conditional offer of eternal life, that is, after Adam's fall, restores the biblical description of the nature of God. God is lovingly gracious, according to the Bible, and therefore not unjust or arbitrary. This realization clarifies the nature of God as He has revealed Himself in attributes of love, mercy, and grace. There was a particular gal that I went to Bible college with a long time ago. Uh, her name was Sheila Druck. And I've heard Sheila introduce herself. She sings songs and just kind of has a beautiful voice, and I love to hear her. Uh, but when she starts out and begins her song, every time when she, in the introduction, she'll say something like, if, you, if we can get the if we can come to an understanding of the nature of God and the nature of man, everything else will fall into place. You see? I think Calvinists have destroyed both the nature of man by saying that he's unable, he's so depraved that he can't believe, won't believe, and they've destroyed the nature of God as expressed in the Bible because the Bible reveals God not that way. Arbitrary, harsh. Uh, what's the difference? Rhetorical question. What's the difference between the God of Calvinism who arbitrarily selects for no revealed reason, thus a secret reason, What's the difference between that God and Allah, the Muslim God, with whom you find no mercy, 
who cannot be placated, who will only reward you if you do evil. But in essence, the nature of Allah and the nature of the Calvinist God is the same. Now that disturbs me because they think, Calvinists think, that God is glorified by his selecting only some and not others. God is magnified. Does that magnify God to you? If you have three children and you decide to love one and not the other two, even if you do them no harm, it will come through. Is that fair to those other children? Don't you treat your children the same? We have, we have two adopted daughters. And uh, they're from Korea. And especially when they're babies, all babies are cute anyway, you know. But we had one there four years apart. And this happened at Dallas. And I'm in the post office at Dallas. It used to be across the street from the seminary. And uh, the Dallas po Seminary Post Office. And I had my girls in there with me for some reason. I stopped in to get my stuff out of the box. And uh, Tanya was probably about, what, maybe six, and Rebecca was probably two, and I had her in my arms, you know. And uh, somebody in this, in the, they, they made a big deal. What a cute little baby, and they were talking about Rebecca. Now, Tanya's standing by my side, nobody's saying anything about Tanya, you see. Uh, and I said, yes, they're both really cool kids. I put my arm around Tanya and brought attention to her, too, because I didn't want to see her treat, treated unfairly. See, when you, when you treat somebody, if, if they're your children and they get treated unfairly, it hurts the heart of old dad, see? And I didn't want either one of them to be hurt. That's fair. Calvinist God's not like that. He can have a lot of people. He only loves certain ones. Well, I don't have time to finish. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to just stop with that. We'll, it'll, other things will be covered. Uh, the total inability is one of the things that, that will fall when we understand both the nature of God and the nature of man. The nature of God is that he is free and absolutely independent. Independence is one of his attributes. He conveyed that nature to mankind, the only one who, the only creation that was made in God's image. And he conveyed that to Adam and Eve, and then subsequently passed on to their children. And we have within us the nature of God. So when we put the nature of God in right perspective, and we put the nature of us, mankind, in proper perspective, then we will come to understand that we can believe him because we are made to believe him. And just because Adam sinned doesn't mean that we have uh, annihilated the idea that he will only save some. So I'm going to uh, stop there. I had, uh, oh, by the way, if you want the whole discussion, I have, what, six pages or something like that. Uh, they will be handed out and they'll be available back there on the uh, counter. So if you uh, took notes, fine, but this is all in the, in the handout that you'll get. I only advanced about two pages, so I'm sorry. But uh, anyway, I'll, right now I have about uh, maybe 10 minutes or so to 15. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take questions. Maybe you had a thought that you'd, or a question that you'd like to add. And uh, I have given you in the handout some scripture references uh, that is used to support the Calvinist position and basically given a very short, quick answer on why that position is not true. I want to do one more thing before I open it up. Uh, this is my book on Calvinism. It's going to be out there in the, in the, on the book table. And uh, I've got a few other books, too, that I don't think probably Bob brought along, but if you'd like to, they're usually on the subject of free grace. Uh, in 2003 through 2005, uh, I, I uh, corresponded with Bob and suggested uh, 
some articles on Calvinism. So I did five articles on Calvinism, what, 20, 25 pages in the, in the, uh, in the Grace Journal, uh, of Journal of the Grace Evangelical Society. Uh, and uh, so I did one on each one of the points. Well, that was fine. Then I studied it some more, and I re then I realized that my idea of election might be in error, or at least I found a better one. <laughs> so uh, in the book, I've put my old argument uh, re-established, sort of re revised, with the idea that election is unto salvation, and that the way God is able to do this is because of His infinite knowledge of all things as seen in time regardless of a time perspective that we, so there was no pre-selection, God just knows who are going to be the saved and that is His election. I, I, I got to thinking about that and I didn't like it, I, I came to not like the position too much. It's still viable logically, but I think there's a better way and that is that uh, election, I've put a whole little paragraph on what I think election is now. Uh, which can al always be revised or, or uh, refined, but it's election unto service, and it's election or selection of those who are in Christ, that is, those who have believed in Christ, not unto salvation, but unto service and unto, as Ephesians say, says, unto us being holy and without blame before Him in love. That applies only to Christians. They are elect not unto salvation, but unto service and fellowship with God forever and ever. Now that, that suits my heart because still God is, it, it takes away all arbitrariness in God and uh, it, it makes just so much sense to me anyway. So I've tried to argue that and I hope that that, that works for you. <clears throat> okay, in regard to anything that I've said or anything else, I guess. Maybe I'll take your questions or if you had a thought or a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the essence of the question is, if, if the God of Islam and the God of Calvinism are similar uh, in definition and understanding, is that the basis upon which the uh, Chrislam or the merging together of Islam and Christianity is based? I don't know. Uh, it seems to fit and it, it could be that way. Uh, I think that the similarity allows the possibility of that. I think I could say that. Uh, well, I guess that's all I can say. As Forrest Gump would say, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay, because without election, there's no, okay, the question is, why did I start with election as the first domino to fall that would push the other ones over? Uh, if election falls and isn't true, there's no need to read into Scripture uh, the ideas of the other four points. There's no need for a limited atonement because there's no specific group of people, of individual, particular people, for which Jesus had to die and nobody else. So the very fact that you would limit the atonement to only a few is based on those who are elected in their mind to begin with. Uh, with without uh, election, there's no need to argue for total depravity, and one of the things that I said in the book is even the Arminian position of prevenient grace is what they call it, which was uh, 
pretty much popularized, I think, by Wesley mostly, uh, John Wesley, is uh, that was a way to get around total depravity. Now, I'm probably going beyond your question here, but I'm just touching on the points. Uh, prevenient grace comes the word to prevent. In other words, the grace of God prevents our sinful nature from believing. Uh, so, in order to prevent our sinful nature from believing, God uses prevenient grace. And therefore, then He sort of like opens the door so that you can hear the gospel and believe. And my question is, what's the difference between prevenient grace and no such thing, if we are able to believe? But they have to have that because they think the old nature prohibits me from believing. So total depravity goes if you don't have election. Uh, there's no need for irresistible grace because God, God has to make the elect believe. And if there's no elect, then there's nobody to make to believe. And uh, it allows for failure in the Christian life because now the, the imposition of perfection, essentially, is there's no need for that. And we, as free grace people, understand that the, the reason for sanctification and obedience and holiness and fellowship with the Lord now is so that we can have a fuller fellowship with Him in, in the world to come. So there's no need for… once election goes, all those other ones are inconsequential and moot. Yes, ma'am. Uh, are you talking about Islam or, or Calvinism? Essentially, just all at once, you know. He, he made these decisions, yeah. That, you don't like that? I, yeah. That's a good question. Well, there, God is their answer. God is glorified by the fact that even though nobody could believe, he picked some out, and they're really going to praise Him forever. Well, you're asking the wrong person, Sharon. <laughs> the question is, all right. Okay. I didn't repeat the question here, and that was what, what was your question essentially, because I want that on the record here. Yeah, I know. Why? Yeah. I don't think it's much of a… The question is, why would anybody embrace that? Well, uh, I have another talk on Calvinism as theological quicksand, and the short answer is because we've been taught that and indoctrinated it from any and every source throughout history, at least from the Reformation time of, say, 1500 or in that area. So that's the question, that's the answer. Why would anybody embrace it? Uh, listen to my talk coming up. All right, now Sharon's question was, what about people who failed in the Bible? Is that, was that essentially your question, Sarah? Okay. Yes, sir. They gave me a mic, which is always dangerous. Wow. So, All right. Person. Um, my question is um, more, it, it's more of a statement and a question together. I've, I've been on the front lines with Calvinism in our area mm -hmm. in Southeast Texas for about 10 years. And I generally get accused of a straw man 
fallacy whenever I bring up the idea of dual election, like you talked about yeah. at the beginning, where God says, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, because they say, no, you're, you're, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Everybody's already going to hell, mm -hmm. and we, God just saves people he decides to have grace on. And I've found it to be, and, and you know, uh, uh, Steve, John Piper and that creepy dude from Dallas, what's his name, uh, Matt Chandler, um, <laughs> has uh, done sermons on how it's not dual election. Uh, I found it pretty useful to go to original sin and talk about, okay, man was not sinful. He was created innocent and perfect. How did God sovereignly direct man to sin without God directly causing sin? And, and that you get the most amazing expressions out of people when you take them to that point. But have you ever, what, what, what are some good avenues that you've found for avoiding being accused of straw man fallacies in going through this? I think I would just try to, un, to, to I think the way you avoid a straw man fallacy is to point it out and to show the inconsistency of the question. Whoever answers, whoever asks the question has the advantage because they're putting their assumptions in the question. And so what you have to do first of all is destroy those assumptions. And when you do that, uh, you can pretty much answer the question like, man is so depraved that he can't believe, where do you, where do you believe, where do you get that from? Well, they're going to say, oh, well, Romans 1 to 3, man is so bad. All right? If you read Romans, and this is one of my points in the book, I think, if I recall what I wrote. Uh, <laughs> but if you read Romans 1.18 all the way to the end of chapter 3 or wherever you want to stop there, you will find not one single place that it ever says that man cannot believe. Mankind doesn't seek God. I say, oh, really? What about the Catholic faith? What about all these people who try to do things to please God? Aren't they seeking God? And so we conclude that that passage of Scripture is basically making a general statement about the condition of lostness of mankind without Christ. It's not telling us how, how bad, and it does, say how, it does describe how bad we can be, but it doesn't say that we're not able to believe. It will tell us that we are not able to do anything to be saved. That's all. So the, the answer to the question is destroy the presupposition and then show where they're, they're not basing it on Scripture. And that's essentially what I did because in the book, I, I, I searched for all these different and, and figured out what Scriptures are they using to base their position on. Okay. Yeah, we're out of time. And my, my, my answer is, is that in each one of the scriptures, absolutely not one single verse, passage of scripture supports any one, any one of the five points of Calvinism. Not one. Now, if you don't have any scriptural support, and if I can show you from the context what the meaning is of that passage that destroys their assumption then there's no basis for their theory. And they might as well read Alice in Wonderland. Thank you.